So, with that said, with no further ado, uh, Noah Sussman, test architect at Etsy. Uh, and uh, just a little bit of a side note, the robot talk that I gave yesterday was actually all of uh, Noah's fault slash uh, egging on. I've hijacked other previous talks that I've given and, and just like said, oh and, oh, and I built this robot. Let me just talk about it. And Noah came up to me after this previous talk at a previous conference, like, you know what? Forget all that other stuff. I just want to see the talk about the robot, just the robot. So I was like, huh, okay. It gave me the social clearing to uh, maybe do that. So uh, awesome. Noah's a badass robot fan, cool guy. And uh, anyway, welcome, welcome, Noah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so um, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I guess, uh, cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I work at Etsy, which is a, um, we call ourselves a handmade marketplace. Um, we are, uh, if you don't know us, we're basically a, um, a forum for the exchange of, of goods made by individuals. Um, and I put the mission statement up here, not, um, this is really talk about me and how I uh, arrived at the, um, at the rather aggressive philosophy toward functional testing that I have today and that Etsy has. Um, but I thought I'd put the mission statement up here because I think it's important to emphasize that I work for a company that values change, authorship, and sustainability. And I think, even though they're maybe not explicit, I think you'll find those themes throughout this talk. Those are values that have always been really important to me. So this is Chad Dickerson's slide. So I, uh, Chad joined in, in, um, in 2008, not me. But um, this is, uh, just in case you're not familiar with, with sort of the Etsy uh, deployment philosophy, we, we push to production a lot. Um, we push to, we push to counting, um, counting dashboards and internal tools, we push to production about 10,000 times in, um, in 2011. Um, and for most of those deploys, tests run. Um, so we deploy anywhere from 20 to 90 times a day. Um, and deploys are expected to take under 20 minutes. Um, that's uh, um, unit tests, functional tests, integration tests, everything. Um, so I wrote a blog post about how we've sharded everything. And um, I'm actually not going to talk so much about uh, the technology, because I think you can, you can read about that on our engineering blog. <coughs> Um, what I'm going to talk about is how I wound up here. So I moved to New York in 1998 to be an artist. And I quickly discovered that one of the things people ask you when you're an artist in New York is, so what's your day job? Um, my day job was unloading trucks and setting up and striking theater tech for industrial events. Um, so as a, as a consequence, I had a lot of carpentry tools and I met um, I met this dude named Willoughby Sharp, who's an old-time art dealer in the city. This photo's probably taken 10 years after we worked together, but Willoughby was in his 70s when, he met, when we met. And the internet was still, in 1998, kind of this weird niche thing that like, some people use, but you don't really want to put your credit card into it. And, and Willoughby got it. Um, and I went out to his art gallery to do some carpentry work one time, and I looked over at, the, I looked over at one point, and he and his webmaster are kind of scratching their head, and, and they're having this problem. And I walk over, and I'm like, are you guys trying to install real player? And they're like, yeah, it's really hard. And, uh, and I was like, no, it's not. Um, and that's how I got into programming. I literally stood up from, um, well, I can really call it programming, web design. Um, I literally stood up from the computer and Willoughby handed me the Peach Pit Press HTML 3.2 book and said, I think, I think you should build my website instead of, instead of doing the carpentry. And I was like, I don't think I know how to do that. And he was like, you, you'll learn. And um, sure enough, I, uh, I, did, I did learn HTML 3 and I learned JavaScript 1.2 and I learned to build awesome websites like this. Um, that is, for the younger people in the room, that is an image map. Absolute state of the art. It's it's too bad that the Wayback Machine didn't save all the code because you could mouse over those those that art and it would it would show a bigger picture. And this was like wow. Um, I also was able to implement a link to MapQuest that would that we could change when we had art shows in different locations and it would show you um, you know it would show you where the where the gallery was and all you had to do was was change a string in the URL. And this was like. This was awesome stuff. Um, so 
In 19, you know, in 1999, websites were, I don't even know how many people in this room remember this term, websites were brochureware, which meant that you, you had like a print, you had like a, a print product, and you gave it to a web designer, right, like, um, and like me, and, they, and, and I would copy and paste the content out of, out of the Quark Express document or whatever, and I would paste it into, I would, I would paste it into like, a, like a primitive CMS and we'd FTP it somewhere and then it would stay there for like a year and you'd never change it. And then after a year you'd do the redesign, right? And the redesign meant you throw away all the code and you start over. And you could do this because it, websites are cheap, they're throwaway, um, nobody really looks at the web anyway. And um, for me, coming from, coming from the arts, um, and coming from theater, I, I had this sort of crazy attitude that like you shouldn't put your name on something that you're not actually proud of. Um, and this was a crazy attitude. Um, my friends all thought I was nuts. It took me way longer to produce sites than, than they did because they would just do the minimum and push it out and I'd actually make sure everything worked first. And really for most clients, it didn't matter. Like they weren't, gonna, they weren't necessarily gonna notice if links were broken, but I wanted to know. And what I found is that as, as websites got a little more, not sophisticated, but they just got bigger, um, you know, on an art gallery page, you got maybe 10 links to click on. When, once you're translating like an issue of a magazine, like say Food and Wine or Travel and Leisure magazine or something, like that, once, you tra once you translate an entire magazine to a website, it's like 70, 80 links. That's a lot of stuff to click on. Um, and I would click on it all and I would sit there for like an hour making sure all the pages loaded and it's like, man, there's gotta be a better way to do this. I know the computer can do it for me. I just gotta figure out how to automate. So this is my first automation rig. The Kensington Supermouse. I still have one on my desk at work. And it turned out that with the Kensington Supermouse, you could put arbitrary keyboard commands into, um, into text boxes, and then you could click the buttons and it would run it for you. So you could do like, you know, control C, alt tab, control V, enter, control C. And like, this was brilliant. Like this, um, it didn't work for everything. It actually didn't work for clicking on links, but it worked for it worked for a lot of use cases, and at least it made my wrist hurt less. And so with this high technology, I was obviously very successful. And um, in, uh, in 2005, I went to work for a large uh, e-commerce apparel company. I met this dude, Ben Strawbridge. And Ben was, like me, a self-taught um, web designer. He has a biology degree. He started out as a ski instructor at Vail and just kind of fell into being a, what used to be called a webmaster. And so Ben and I got along really well. And then one day, like bummer, he moved away from New York, he moved back to the West Coast to work for this little startup that no one had ever heard of called Splunk. And we kept in touch, and one day Ben sends me an email from Splunk and he's like, we have this crazy thing. You gotta check it out, right? It is this tool that lets you execute arbitrary JavaScript. And, and fire DOM events. And one of the things that this tool can do is it can fire the on-click event and it can simulate clicking on links so you don't have to. So you can just, you can just program it. You can, you can write an HTML table and then you can run it. And, then it and you can watch it walk through your whole website and you can tell if stuff works but you don't have to click anything. And this was, this was brilliant. And this was full of win, first of all, because all it was was JavaScript and HTML. It was made entirely of technology that I completely understood. Um, and also, you didn't need Windows admin rights to install it because it was just a frame set. And this was important because I'm tell I'll, I'll tell you, in 2005, in an enterprise e-commerce shop in New York, you're not getting Windows admin rights, and you're definitely not getting IT to install some crazy open source thing on your workstation. But this ran off of a USB key, and it was code that I could easily write it wasn't a head switch because I was writing HTML all day anyway. And, um, and I used it to test a couple of projects. Um, and it worked really well and I didn't have to click as much and this was really great. Um, and, and then the deadline started looming and I didn't have time to maintain the test. So I took it to my bosses and I was like, look, you know, I'm using this new technology, it's like, it makes everything so much more, you know, it, it cuts out bugs, it's awesome. And they were like, yeah, well, we're not moving the deadline. So the, my test died. Um, and the product shipped. And from that I learned, I learned something really important that, um, this is a shirt that our, our CTO, Kellen, made, and so you can buy it on Etsy. Um, 
But I learned, this, I learned this way back then in 2005, that if you have to choose between having really good test coverage and shipping something to the customer, to ship it. Um, because otherwise nobody gets paid, and if nobody gets paid, then there's no, uh, then there's no time to, to write uh, better tests. So then the social web happened, and all of a sudden uh, there were things like Gmail and Google Maps, and you'd look at the JavaScript and it was insane. It was like minified, like, because you had to, because there was actually that much JavaScript. Like, who could imagine that? Um, but all of a sudden it was reality. And all of a sudden, websites, websites were this serious thing with business value. Um, so in 2007, I actually found myself leading like a large, high-value project for a really big client. Um, and this, this was sort of like, this, this project still is kind of my canonical, um, you know, my sort of canonical web project because the teams were separated, the UI was delivered way in advance of the, of the back end, and then we, you know, months later we'd go to put the back end together with the UI and like that, no, this. Um, and so this was also the first time I'd worked with a dedicated automated testing team. And they were, they were using rational functional tester, but it's the same, same problem set of like we have these expaths and you guys aren't really telling us what you're doing when you're building the UI and you're sort of subject to the demands of the back end team and like basically we wake up one day and all our tests are broken. And so the way that we wound up solving this was, was kind of the way that everybody approaches this now, but it was sort of interesting in 2007 and we kind of had to figure it out ourselves. We decoupled the UI from the back end. We, um, we enabled uh, hydrating the UI templates with XML fixtures. Uh, the back end team could just ship us new fixtures when they changed the data contract. Um, and this gave us time to do things like make sure all the HTML was valid which was valuable not so much for, for validity in itself, but it was valuable because if you weren't on the UI team, you didn't know to run the validator, and then you would invalidate the HTML, and then we'd open it up the next day and we'd be like, oh, the little validator icon in the bottom right corner of Firefox is red, somebody touched our code, I wonder what happened. And this was like, awesome. I mean, this, this cut out a lot of churn. Um, so from this I learned like that Treating the UI as a contract is a really good idea because if you, have, if you have a testing team, then the UI is a contract with those testers, whether you acknowledge it or not, but you win by acknowledging it. So then, because we had this really clean UI, I, was, I thought, great, I'm gonna introduce the front end developers to the, to the Ruby Selenium driver and we're gonna be able to test all our JavaScript and this completely failed. Um, it failed because um, this is still 2007, there's not really an expectation that a front-end developer is going to have heavy, heavy coding chops. At least this is what I thought at the time. And so they just, it just, it was too much time, it was too much work for, for what they thought they could get out of it. And that was, uh, you know, disappointing but interesting. So in 2008 I went to a startup, and we had, you know, we were a rail startup and we are going to be test driven, and then again the deadlines came. And we never were able to write any of the tests that we planned. Um, and for various reasons, we were under a lot of product constraints. The UI kept changing. So even if I'd written the Selenium test, they would have, they would have been obsolete immediately. So out of desperation, what I did is I wrote a Perl script that literally was just a, a for loop that ran through a bunch of URLs and died if it, um, if it saw a non-200 response code. Um, and I never got to write any of the sort of like subtle validations against the JSON endpoints or anything like that that I planned. But this script, to my surprise, and it wasn't even in a build system, I just run it every morning, it caught a lot of bugs. Um, and it eliminated that really terrible UI developer problem where like I spent an hour trying to figure out what I did to break the template and then I realized that like, oh, the JSON endpoint isn't really serving the right data. And so nothing works, and it's nothing to do with my code. So this way I just came in in the morning and found out that things were broken, and I could talk to the developers, and they'd fix it. And, and I never really, I, ne I never wrote any complicated, cool tests with an awesome framework at all. Um, so from this I learned probably the most important um, single lesson of my whole career working with tests, which is that the simplest thing that can possibly work usually catches a lot of bugs. And then there's sort of a diminishing 
there's a rapidly like diminishing uh, rate of return on more complicated uh, tests because they require more maintenance. The Perl script didn't require any maintenance, and it caught um, it caught like it caught most of the most of the errors that we introduced were like I'm gonna I broke the endpoint. Not like I subtly changed the endpoint so it returned slightly different data, but it's still val like I, I don't recall a time when that happened, but I, re I remember lots of times when we made the endpoints 500. So in 2009, I left the startup and I went to work on um, for a really large e-commerce company on some really big projects. And I saw some really interesting approaches to Selenium. And this was the first time that I had worked with a really senior dev team. I, you know, because front end was changing, the web was changing, um, and it was starting to become sort of accepted that you were going to, you know, you were going to know the, the stack end to end. You know, you weren't just going to be a JavaScript hacker. You weren't just going to know CSS. You were going to be able to go into the middle tier. And do, so not only was I working with a really senior team, but I actually got to talk to them. And I got to see some of the really interesting things that these guys had done with Selenium, such as making hundreds of play and record tests and saving them in HTML files. Um, and this was, this was really not effective because basically one, dot, one guy spent a day in a room the day before the release running all of these tests and then he'd walk around and talk to the people who he thought had broken stuff and nobody, there was no visibility. So, um, you know, development was continuing apace and you never really knew if stuff was broken because the tests were obsolete or because, or because something was actually wrong. Um, so the next thing we did is we, we dumped all of our manual test cases out of our test manager and we, um, we shipped the spreadsheet off to an outsource agency who converted all of the tests into Selenium uh, Ruby tests. And this didn't, this didn't work at all. I, I wound up with a suite of about 700 tests that you could, you could just run them over and over again and never get the whole suite to pass and never get the same set of tests to fail. And um, so from this I learned that First of all, you need some serious programming chops to get Selenium tests right. Um, and you need to be, in, I think you need to be inside the firewall or you need to have really close communication with people inside the firewall because just reading what was in that spreadsheet, it really didn't tell you anything about what the use cases were. And, and the spreadsheet actually contained a lot of sort of implicit statements. Like for instance, like I know that sign in means, you know, sign in and like, and also you have a Twitter account like attached to your account because otherwise some of the tests won't work. But that's not necessarily going to be documented in, a manu in, the, in the manual tests. And if you're going to document all that stuff to the point that people who know nothing about your domain can implement it, you might as well just write your own tests. The other interesting thing I saw was, um, was that the guys who had really deep knowledge of the application stack knew about all of the subtle, interesting stuff that could go wrong and they spent a lot of time building out tooling to talk to the database and to, um, you know, and to simulate these sort of really subtle cases, and it never shipped. Um, we just ran out of time. So in the end, I wrote a couple of really little tests for the critical path for what my group was working on. I ran them on a cron. An email went out if the test broke. And this actually worked really well, except, and again, remember, this is the first time I'd really put Selenium tests in front of like, serious programmers. And I found that they couldn't understand what the tests were doing either. They would look at the, they'd look at the, at the um, output from the log and they'd say, what did it do? Um, and it started to hear the classic question like, well, isn't the test broken because it says element not found? Right, the, it, couldn't find, it couldn't find the thing to click on, so, so it doesn't work. And it's like, well, maybe, but you gotta know what it does. Um, and then the, the sort of, the, the question I'm sure everybody's heard is like, isn't, well, these tests are cool, but once we update the UI, isn't everything gonna break? And, um, you know, I found that the idea of UI as contract is, is not as widespread as I had thought. Um, so then I went and did some mobile testing. And this actually was really interesting because here we didn't have a big team. Mobile was really new. I was the only, I was the only test engineer. I had a lot, we had a lot of time constraints. Um, so again, like, I couldn't build the complicated, subtle tests that I planned to build. Um, I basically could get the framework working and I could write a couple of tests that proved that the app wasn't going to crash when you launched it. And to my surprise, this was incredibly valuable because it saved the QA team from coming in in the morning 
blocking out a bunch of time to test and then realizing that the commit last night had broken the app and they weren't going to be able to test. They knew up front they could use their time for something else. And so this is where I started to do the kind of value calculation around, well, there's, there's three QA people and they waste four hours on a broken build. And so if I spend 12 hours one week developing code that just proves that the build's not broken, well, then that saves us 12 hours, like potentially every week forever, and that's huge. Um, so with this success, I was recruited by Etsy. Um, and this was really interesting because Etsy had been following what IMVU was doing, and, it's, and they'd built their own CI system already. So I came into a working, instead of, for the first time ever, instead of being brought on and hearing like, oh, well, we want to test, but we don't know what to do, and we, we got to pick tools. I came in and everything was already running, except it was really slow. Um, and it was really slow. It was really slow in terms of development. It was really slow in terms of running. Um, the test tested everything. They just cast a really wide net over the application. They looked at like every area where risk could possibly be introduced. They had to do all kinds of hacky stuff like sleeping to, because the back end was slow and you had to wait. And they were written in Python and our stack is PHP. So in terms of development, it was a huge head switch. And what we found is that if you expect developers to maintain tests, like asking them to switch to a different language every time they write the test is not really workable. Um, so fortunately, at the same time that I was hired, John Allspaw came over from Flickr, and John is a big proponent of monitoring. So while I was sort of exploring this interesting system that IT had built, I was watching Ops build out um, all of this instrumentation for our system. And at that time, Eric Kastner was writing StatsD, which is our metrics collection daemon, which you can find on our GitHub. Um, and, there, uh, and so what I found was that after a couple of months, I was looking at this monitor wall with these real-time graphs of real events in production. And this is sort of the classic, does this thing work? This is sort of the classic um, you know, Etsy deploy graph where it's like, here we pushed out something that broke a bunch of stuff. And we got like 600 PHP warnings. And then this is, so this is time. So this is, this is 20 minutes, right? So like probably about here we went, oh crap, that was not a good deploy. And then here, about 15 minutes later, we're like, OK, well, let's fix it. And then no more warnings. So I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at these tests that are, that are incredibly expensive and take like 35 plus minutes to run if they pass. If you've got to bounce them, they take an hour. And we're, and we're going like, hey, a lot of this stuff that we're testing with Selenium is actually monitored now. And we can see what it's doing in real time. And we can fix it in 20 minutes or less if we need to, except we can't because we've got to wait 35 to, minutes to an hour for the test. So what we wound up doing was scrapping a lot of the tests uh, in favor of speed. Um, and we also did a ton of work to make, it, to make the PHP unit uh, runner work with our stack. Because X unit runners never work out of the box with anybody's stack. It takes, again, it takes some pretty serious development to get um, to make it easy to write unit tests. And again, you can find some of that work on our GitHub. Um, so we wound up in a place where, this is my Etsy store, it's, it's awesome. Um, but um, we wound up in a place where we have like a quarter million real-time graphs that show us everything that's happening in production. Uh, and thousands of unit tests that are written and maintained by the engineering team. And like about 10 Selenium tests that we run every time we deploy, so 20 to 50 times a day. So instead of casting this really wide net, we basically just hammer the critical path with Selenium tests. And we run a lot of these tests in production, like monitoring, um, because, uh, because, it's, it's, because basically we, can, we value recovery um, as much as detection. Um, and so I just point this out up here in the corner. This is the kind of stuff we do. So this is every Etsy employee who signed in has this. This is, this is the time it took the page to render. And this, this little link here is interesting. It says XHProf. If you click that, you get a debug dump of like everything that happened while that PHP page was rendering. And this is in production. Um, so it's sort of like, I sort of think of it as like, the, the, this, is, this, is what, this is what the future of manual testing looks like, right? Not, not QA people sitting in a room clicking through scripts until, the release, until, like it's, until we know, quote unquote, know that it's safe to release the software. It's everybody in the organization using, um, using the product 
and having like this great visibility and transparency into what's going on and being able and, and being empowered to say, hey, I think that page took a little too long to render. So I mean, I get community managers, right, sending emails to engineering and be like, hey, I noticed that this page is, the, the, the PHP portion of this page is rendering slowly. That's awesome, right? That cuts out, it cuts out the need to do a lot of sort of gated checking. Um, and we rewrote our tests in PHP. So this is what our, you know, this is what our Selenium code looks like today. No sleeps, um, same language as the stack, uh, and, and, and really like pretty simple. Um, not a whole lot of complexity. So, um, so yeah, so that's pretty much how I, how I got to, uh, to be here and to sort of summarize what I learned. It's really, it's pretty simple stuff. Basically maintaining a big functional test suite is hard. You should treat it as hard. Um, I've seen a lot of organizations fail to really succeed with functional testing because it, you know, it's, oh, it's just JavaScript. Oh, it's just the UI. Oh, it's just, uh, it's just what the manual testers do. Well, none of that stuff is easy. Um, the interpretation of functional tests is also difficult. Uh, just because you're an awesome engineer um, and you can do hard algorithmic stuff, it doesn't mean you can interpret a Selenium stack trace. That's a skill. Um, and it's a skill that requires some familiarity with the UI and the DOM. Um, so you need people that know how to do it. And, and often, um, you know, often it's not worth it to pay the price for all of that complexity. Often you can get away with a five-line Perl script that just curls endpoints, especially if you're a startup or you're a new project. I mean, you really have to think about what, is the, what are the trade-offs in value um, between having like really awesome test coverage and just shipping your product. And again, I really believe, and I've, I've seen it illustrated over and over, that just being able to catch the worst errors automatically and being able to ship quickly is really, really valuable. It's a lot more valuable than being able to pr prove, prove programmatically that nothing's broken. You can't actually prove programmatically that nothing's broken, and you're gonna break stuff. It happens. Every website goes down, every piece of software has bugs. It's being able to fix the problems fast that's really important. So, um, so the approach that I've, that, I've, that I've taken is, you know, first do the simplest thing that can possibly work. The tests are slow, can we turn them off? The, um, the deadline is, the deadline is uh, looming, can we get away with that test? Can we get away with just a Perl script? Um, often you can. And when you can't, you, um, you know, you need expertise. Uh, so if you have that kind of expertise, we are hiring. And, uh, and um, yeah, thanks, to your, uh, thanks for listening to my esoteric story about selenium. And um, I will, uh, if it's possible to ask questions about that meandering talk, I will, I will take questions now. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. So thank you, Noah. Yeah, thanks. Just you said uh, you use a dynamic combination for writing your uh, functional uh, tests. Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? <laughs> Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, you just said you use B hat and Ming combination to write your functional tests. Mm -hmm. uh, how how do you uh, differentiate like uh, writing tests in B hat and writing tests in Selenium? Like using uh, Ming or something like that. You use uh, PHP unit plus Mink combination, right? Um, it's Behat and Mink. We use, uh, we, so we have set up all of our tests um, so that they can run, they can either run headlessly or they can run with a GUI. So in the CI system, we run, a, I believe we're using Sahi to run headlessly, but don't quote me on that. Um, so generally, yeah, we run, uh, um, we're, I mean, we're not using PHP. You can use, uh, you can use Mink and, and be hat now without PHP unit. And there's actually, I believe Sebastian took, I believe Sebastian dropped the, the Selenium driver stuff from PHP unit, or I think he, I'm not sure if he dropped it, but he's definitely said like be hat is sort of the, is the road forward in terms of driving Selenium tests with, uh, with PHP. My question is, uh, 
you you need to write to Gherkin stuff uh, in order to implement your behat scenarios and stuff. So at Gherkin's for all these step definitions uh, and all this stuff, or you just write the plain Selenium tests. Um, sorry, we, can you? I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Okay. Uh, are you writing Gherkins uh, for the implementing Behat and Mink stuff, or you just write the plain Selenium tests um, without writing Gherkins? Well, we're using. A, let's see, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but we're writing. Um, I mean, this is what our step definitions look like. So, um, so yeah. I mean, we write our step definitions with Mink. That's the abstraction layer, kind of the same, it works, Mink is the same, is basically the PHP port of Capybara. Um, and then we have, uh, and then we have cucumber stories that call the step definitions. Does that answer the question? Okay. All right. Yeah, catch me after if you, if you want more detail. I can show, I mean, I can, I can show you some of the code if you're interested. Okay. Uh, basically, we were using Behat and Mink combinations uh, on a board project, so we are writing Gherkins and implementing step definitions with Mink and stuff. So, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can understand the approach of releasing quickly and focusing recovery more than confidence from a developer's perspective, but I could see that raising the hackles of a lot of traditional manual testers and possibly of executive sponsors. So did you have any trouble getting them on board with your approach? Well, so again, like this first slide, um, that is uh, with the sort of bragging rights about how many times we deploy, that's, that's a slide from our um, this is a slide from our CEO's talk at South by Southwest this year. So, and I think that that, I mean, the, I, it's interesting like how much that question comes up at testing conferences, like how do you get people on board? What about resistance? Um, and like I talked about, I mean, I've, I've gotten, I've, I've started writing tests at lots of organizations to be told like, hey, that's not important. That's not a good use of time. And I think that um, that's one of the things that drew me to Etsy is that they were already sold on this approach from, from upper management down. Um, they already did not have a manual, like a formal manual QA team. Um, they were really committed to this. And I think that, um, you know, I think that that's, that's a key element in making, in making any kind of software process work, but in making continuous delivery work. If you have, if you have leadership that are really committed to doing, you know, agile in two week sprints, that's what you're going to do. You might be able to introduce, some, in my experience at least, you might be able to introduce some process improvements, but you're not going to change, you know, it's not possible to change the entire culture of a company from the bottom up just by introducing a technology, sadly. Um, so yeah, for, um, I mean, there, there certainly is a balance that we try to strike between um, making sure that things work before they're rolled out to the public. And this is something you can read about on our blog, but everything that we release is behind an AB framework. So, and this is, Facebook does something similar with their latest environment. I think a few companies are doing it now. But when, so when I talk about all of those deploys, most of those deploys are not visible to, to you. Most of those deploys are behind feature flags or they're behind an AB campaign. And the, typically the way we roll out those AB campaigns is goes out to employees first. Right, or it's, it's actually, it's live in dev first and you can check it there, but it'll go, out, it'll go out live pretty quickly and it's live to people that work there. And like those little page timers that I, that I showed, it's live to everyone in the organization by default, you can't turn it off. So if we push something, in the, you know, in the rare case we push something out and it is a little broken, we see it first. Um, and in the very rare case where we push something out and it's sort of, we, you know, maybe there's an, a, an you know, a, a reference to an undeclared variable or something like that, that's where the graphs come in. Um, so you see it immediately before it, before it really causes impact. Um, and I'd say in most, I mean, we had, I don't know the numbers for 2011. In 2010, I believe we had six severity one change related outages, which based on organizations I've worked for, I think is pretty low. Um, so most of the times that, you know, you see us and we're showing those graphs spiking or whatever, those, those, those spikes have, little to no, usually no user-facing impact. We just, we see it, we fix it. Um, so 
it did, you know, and there certainly, I, I was not sold on this when I, when I joined. I mean, I, I came from, you know, I came from companies that did Agile and did, you know, weekly releases, quarterly releases, yearly releases. So it took us all a while to get our heads around it, but part of it is that it, once, you, once you do it, and once you have the experience of, of something's wrong in production, and now we fixed it, and it's been 20 minutes, it, that sells people pretty quick. And, it's not, and, and, and I'm not talking about, like, we broke the site. I'm talking about, like, oh, the marketing team just called and realized that, like, the copy is wrong and for, like, this new campaign that we launched, and, like, we need to change it. In a lot of organizations I've worked in, like the CEO would now be sitting there biting his nails for two weeks while, like, while the wrong copy's up there. At Etsy, like the CEO gets in the deploy queue and pushes the new copy. Um, so getting to that point, I think, is getting to that point is a little bit of like finding an organization that wants to do it. But once you get to that point, it's, it becomes very addictive. Yep. which leads into the break, right? <laughs> so thank, thank you again. Yeah, to thanks. Uh, so uh, we have a break here until 11.20. Uh, coming, come back uh, at 11.20 for Alan Parkinson, automated security testing. And track B is craft automation framework for testing. And also, I'm looking at that on the Selenium Conference Android app because this is out of date, so turn it over and look at the URL to download the app, and now you'll have an updated schedule. So I'll see you back here, or track B, in uh, 20 minutes. Thank you. Yep. And there's, um, there's a ton of Etsy stickers down here on the stage, if you want one.